morning. It's good to see everyone out this morning to receive from the Lord and his word and sacraments for us. If you have your bulletin announcement sheet, I'd like to ask you to please turn to that. A couple announcements to pass along to you. Today, pretty typical. Um, as we can see, we had the Sunday school hour uh, following this. Uh, just a reminder, that is also on the Facebook Live as well. So if you want to head home and tune into that, we are going through the book of Acts. And so that is at 9.15. Um, this week, as we look, men's Bible study on Tuesday. Ladies' Bible study is continuing on Tuesday. Confirmation on Wednesday. Um, so we had last Wednesday off for confirmation um, due to Veterans Day. But we're going to be back at it this Wednesday as well. So keep that in mind. So the hangout is at 3.30, confirmation at 4.15, and evening prayer at 5.30. Keep in mind also we can see altar circle is going to be starting on Fridays. So if you are able and willing to come on out on Fridays at 10, we're working on trying to get uh, things set up for Sundays, um, getting the candles filled, uh, communion set up, and so forth. And so we've had that for the past couple of years, and we kind of postponed it due to COVID, but we're going to try to get that up and starting. Uh, as Obviously, if you come on out for that, um, We'll uh, split you all up in groups and get things organized for Sundays. On the very back of the bulletin, there's some information, too, about the Festival of the Trees. Uh, Newsletters are in for November, so keep that in mind as well. Are there any other announcements that need to be made at this time that I may have overlooked? Yes, Diane. Okay, so it'll be this Saturday? Okay, so left some making, do they have to say ufta? Ufta, lefta, yeah, left some making this Saturday, the youth will be working on uh, pre-orders only, and so uh, that'd be good for Thanksgiving season. I know our Thanksgiving is not complete unless you have lefsa. So this Saturday, if you have any questions, talk to Diane or Amanda um, about that as well. Also, as a way to reminder, um, always forget to mention this, please uh, fill out the blue book and uh, pass that on down and leave it back in the pew there. We'd greatly appreciate that as well. Well, today we are Divine Service Setting 3. We are the 23rd Sunday after Trinity, and we have a most profound question Jesus is posed with. What do we give to Caesar? What do we give to God? That is indeed a very good question. A most appropriate question for us to consider in our day and age. We're going to hear about that text from Jesus as they try to trap him on giving unto Caesar and giving unto God. We're going to hear about that in the sermon as well this morning. But before we do so, our opening hymn of invocation is hymn number 802, hymn number 802.
ask the congregation to please stand as we turn to the top of page 184, page 184. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all of my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by the virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue with the introit, printed on the inside of your bulletin, sung to the tune of C. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for wholeness and not for evil. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me. And I will hear you. Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Surely as salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Faithfulness springs up from the ground, and righteousness looks down from the sky.
Let us pray. O Lord, absolve your people from their offenses, that from the bonds of our sin, which by reason of our frailty we have brought upon ourselves, we may be delivered from your delivered by your bountiful goodness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Congregation may be seated. The Old Testament reading for the 23rd Sunday after Trinity is from Proverbs chapter 8. For wisdom is better than jewels, and all that you may desire cannot compare with her. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence, and I find knowledge and discretion. The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil, pride and arrogance and the way of evil, and perverted speech I hate. I have counsel and sound wisdom, I have insight, I have strength. By me kings reign and rulers decree what is just. By me princes rule and nobles, all who govern justly. I love those who love me and those who seek me diligently find me. Riches and honor are with me, enduring wealth and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, even fine gold, and my yield than choice silver. I walk in the ways of righteousness and the paths of justice, granting an inheritance to those who love me and filling their treasuries. The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of old. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from Philippians chapter 3. Brothers, join in imitating me and keeping your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us, for many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their, destru- their end is destruction. Their God is their belly and their glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand. Holy Gospel, according to St. Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle Jesus in his talk, and they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully, and You do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled, and they left him and went away. This is the Gospel of the Lord. With one heart and one voice, we confess the holy faith is expressed in the words of the Nicene Creed on page 191. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, 
light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being a one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Congregation may be seated for the hymn of the day, hymn number 730, hymn number 730. In the name of Jesus, amen. My friends, question for you this morning. What is your responsibility to the government? Yes, to the government, to the state. What do you owe the state? Now, while you're contemplating that question, ask yourself this question as well. What is your responsibility to God, to the church? Yes, what do you owe the church? 
Now, as we contemplate these two questions, you may, yes, you may be tempted to put all your eggs in one basket, as they say. In other words, you may be tempted to put all of your trust and your energy, your devotion, your submission, exclusively either in the state or the church. And so if you lean towards the state, if the state says jump, well, then you will expect everyone to jump, including the church. And if you do not jump, and people do not jump around you, you will wave your finger at them and call them out to properly obey authority, to obey the state. Or if you lean towards the church, on the other hand, and the church says sit, well, you will expect everyone, including the state, to sit, and if people do not sit, you will wave your finger at them and call them out to obey proper authority. But my friends, there is a fundamental flaw in this kind of thinking. You see, Jesus says that we are to give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that belong to God. And so Jesus does not choose, he does not choose the state over and above the church. And get this, he also does not choose the church over and above the state. So what this means is that you, as a Christian, yes, each and every one of you as a Christian, you are not a secularist only reporting to the state. Also, as a Christian, you must keep in mind that you are not a monk or a nun that reports exclusively to the church. Beware of being a secularist and exclusively looking to the state alone. And also beware of being a monk or a nun, exclusively looking to the church alone. You see, in our reading from the gospel, it's the gospel of Matthew, Jesus was obviously challenged over the situation between God and Caesar, between the state and the church, if we can say it that way. Keep in mind, the Roman Empire, during that day and age, is that Roman Empire was a very pagan nation. The state was full of covetousness, and it was full of fraud and sexual immorality, sexual pleasures and self-pleasure, and so forth. It was by no means a wholesome government. The Romans were heathens. They knew nothing of correct worship. They knew nothing of God's word. And yet, yes, yet, Jesus clearly shows that as a Christian, that Christians do not withdraw from the secular heathen realm. We do not have to become a monk or a nun. He calls Christians, get this, to give unto Caesar, yes, to give unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. In other words, give Caesar what is his. Give Caesar what is his. But this is where we must be extremely careful. What belongs to Caesar? Guess what belongs to the state? The most appropriate question. The obvious answer is that everything belongs to God himself because God is the one who established the state for the sake of keeping good order in society. However, because God has established the church and the state for the sake of good order and blessing mankind, well, things properly belong to the realm of the state and there are other things that properly belong to the realm of the church. Now, it should be self-evident that the things that belong to the state are things such as money and possessions and property and taxes and roads and jobs and laws and mandates and so forth. These are the things of the state. And the things that belong to the church? Well, your soul, your faith, your worship, these divine services, the sacraments, the word, confession and so forth, they belong to the realm of the church. But as you know, this does not always work very well. History has shown us that the church at times has called people to give the things of Caesar's unto the church. The church has wandered at times in the past from its proper calling and dabbled in the realm of the state in the past. We can obviously think of the many abuses by the Roman Catholic Church in the medieval ages, in the mid medieval ages where the Pope and the church gobbled up the state. But today, <clears throat> but today, what is perhaps a bigger concern than the church gobbling up the state is the threat of the state demanding Christians 
to give unto Caesar the things that belong to God. Now, fortunately for us here in North Dakota, for us North Dakotans, all the past executive orders, all the past mandates and the provisions and laws of 2020, they have all provided exclusions for the church. As Christians, we must applaud North Dakota governing officials for not overstepping into the realm of the church. They have been very wise in 2020 in recognizing the realm of the the state and the church, and again, providing exclusions for the church. So just to be crystal clear, all of the adjustments that we have made here at St. Paul's this past year to accommodate for COVID-19 are not because of executive orders or mandates or laws made to the church. There are no mandates, there are no laws and executive orders directed at the church this past 2020 with respect to COVID. Everything we have done here at St. Paul's has been done on our own voluntary will to try and best serve our members of this church. But my friends, what if that day comes along that the state does make mandates and laws or executive orders that include the church? Mandates and laws and executive orders that infringe on our worship, infringe on our prayers and our piety. Then what? Perhaps a, very, perhaps a very appropriate biblical story for us to consider this morning is the book of Daniel. You see, some 600 years before Jesus, Daniel was in a kingdom called Babylon. And as was Daniel's custom, actually three times a day, he would get down on his knees before an open window on the second level of his residence, and he'd pray towards Jerusalem to thank his Lord and God. However, long story short, as things came about, a royal decree was made that over a period of 30 days, no one should be able to pray to God, or any God, for that matter of fact, any pagan God, except to the king of Babylon. Yes, the prayers were to be directed to King Darius, and that alone. So after the decree, an edict was established with the king's seal, and it was a done deal. No more praying for Daniel to God at all. Now, keep in mind that Daniel tended to be the type of person who would cross his T's and dot his I's with all the laws of the governing authorities. Daniel was no crazy radical rebel looking to pick a fight or stir the pot. And so it makes sense that Daniel did not indulge in some sort of heated protest after the decree came about. Daniel did not start a riot. He did not go down to the local marketplace and trash a person's pottery business or overthrow a person's table of fresh fish. He did none of this. Instead, Daniel, get this, he went home. He went to his upper chamber. He opened his window and he prayed towards Jerusalem, giving thanks to God. Daniel did not change anything one bit. Not one bit. Now, I suppose Daniel could have kept the window shut and he could have prayed quietly with a hushed voice. He probably could have waited till the evening when everybody was asleep and listening to make sure people were snoring and then prayed at that time. Or perhaps he could have said to himself, you know, it's only 30 days. I will wait. It'll be okay. I can fast from my prayers and worship for 30 days. But he didn't. Now, the reason why Daniel did not change his custom of daily worship and prayer was that the prayer and the worship of Daniel, that prayer and worship of Daniel, were not things that belonged to King Darius. That is to say, Daniel was called to give unto King Darius what belonged to King Darius, but the prayers and the worship of Daniel, they did not belong to King Darius, but they belonged to God. And so Daniel could not give to King Darius that which was not for his taking. Daniel did not bow or respect or even seem to listen to King Darius' edict, his decree, because King Darius did not have the authority to make such an edict and a decree in the first place. And so it's quite clear If and when the state makes decrees and mandates and laws that infringe on the church, We Christians are not breaking the fourth commandment when we peacefully 
peacefully resist. Please hear me very clearly. Please hear this very clearly. We must be ready as Christians for the time when the state does overstep. For when the state does overstep, we must guard ourselves against grabbing pitchforks with a riotous spirit on the one hand, or on the other hand, rationalizing away our faith to the point of giving the state the green light to overstep its bounds. If the state oversteps, we need not rise up with a pitchfork. Indeed, we need not rise up with a pitchfork, and we also need not roll over with weakness, but we must be ready to calmly continue with our worship of God, knowing that we are not disloyal citizens, but faithful to God and not man. But what if there's consequences? Well, if there are consequences or suffering for not honoring the state, if the state perhaps would overstep, well, we shall trust the favor of God and his deliverance to sustain us as we do each and every week as we live in this valley of tears. Remember, my friends, you are not a secularist living only exclusively by the authority of the state. Each and every one of you, you are a Christian. You are also not a monk living only exclusively by the authority of the church. You are a Christian. You are a citizen of both the state and the kingdom of God. You give unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar and unto God what belongs to God. And when the church gets greedy, taking all that is Caesar's, when the church attempts to gobble up the realm of Caesar, well, you shall resist with a calmness, a calm resolve, because you are baptized into Christ. And when the state gets greedy and takes what belongs to God, well, you shall resist as well, making the sign of the, sign of the cross upon your head and your heart, marking yourself and knowing you are one of the redeemed, knowing that you are baptized, you shall resist with a calmness and assurance in Christ. Both the state and the church must be sharply distinguished while respecting their roles so that they are not opposed to each other. They both find their origin and their authority in the Lord as they work together in harmony side by side. Two separate kingdoms, two realms, but ultimately servants of the Lord for your benefit. You belong to Christ. Give unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Give unto God what is God's. You are the baptized. You are Christians. In the name of Jesus, amen. Ask congregation to please stand for the offertory. Congregation may be seated for the offering. As a way of reminder, the offering plate is in the back of the sanctuary. Offerings can also be delivered to the church office or conducted through the church website.
Ask the congregation to please stand. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. For the baptized, that they would walk according to the faith they've been given, always remembering that they have been marked as those who have been redeemed by Christ the crucified. Let us pray to the Lord. For the healing of division among God's people, that the Lord would curb sinful ambitions, silence the desires of our sinful flesh, and grant us hearts to be reconciled with each other in Christ's love, so that all people will know we are his disciples. Let us pray to the Lord. For true humility among the saints, that we may never be arrogant or prideful, and thus provoke the Lord's wrath, but in all, lo- in all lowliness be made partakers of the gifts of his grace. Let us pray to the Lord. For our national, state, and local officials, all who work in government, and all who contribute to our general welfare, that God would grant them wisdom and temperance, and for our police, firefighters, and all who serve in the armed forces, that they may be kept from harm and danger, and that in accordance with God's will, peace may be established in our day. Let us pray to the Lord. For the sick and the injured, we pray especially for Carl and Charlotte, Darcy, David, Gloria, Janice, Jeff, Janice, Joellen, Justin, Lars, Melissa, Marilyn, Philip, Rita, Sue, Tim, and Tom that God will grant them comfort and healing in according in accordance with his will. Let us pray to the Lord. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. As we approach the table, the Lord's table this, this morning, we approach repentance and faith to receive the gifts the Lord has for us in his body and blood given and shed for us. If you're not a member of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Senate, or one of our sister congregations, we do still invite you to please come forward, kneel, and cross your arms to receive a blessing this morning. If you'd like to partake of this wonderful gift of the altar, please talk to me after the service about membership here at St. Paul's. As a way of reminder, as you come forward, please uh, section off uh, with distance with each family as we receive God's gifts this morning. We continue on page 194. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times, at all places, give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, our Lord and trusting in his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all, all of you. This cup is a New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Professor Harding, you should please stand for the Nunc Dimittis on page 199. Thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith towards you and in fervent love towards one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Maybe you see it before our departing hymn, hymn number 850, hymn number 850.
Well, it's good to see each and every one of, of you out here this morning. Um, also, just as a way of reminder, um, obviously we mentioned this last week that uh, it's a pattern has kind of developed uh, through this whole time that as the threat level goes up, our attendance goes a little bit down, but then we see the direct correlation where online attendance goes way up. So we want to make sure to make a special mention to all of our members who are joining online at this time, watching in. And so uh, greetings to you as well. With that in mind, we heard today, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's, unto God what is God's. And we realize that we are Christians, we live in both realms, and we give unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and we give unto God what is God's. And when that does not happen, when the state or the church overstep, we are faithful, we are secure in our baptisms, and we continue on as a church, as Christians. You are baptized into Christ, you belong to Jesus. Stay steady, stay safe in his grace. Amen.